three people are standing in line at the gates of heaven. The man at the front of the line steps up to St. Peter. St. Peter asks, denomination? The man replies, Methodist. St. Peter looks down at his list carefully and says, go to room 13, but be very quiet as you pass room 8. A woman in line steps forward. Again, St. Peter asks, denomination? The woman answers, Baptist. St. Peter instructs her, go to room 18, but be quiet as you pass by room 8. Finally, the last person in line steps forward. St. Peter again inquires, denomination? This last person replies, Lutheran. St. Peter again instructs, go to room 11, but be quiet as you pass room 8. The last person replies, I don't get it. Why do you keep telling us to be quiet as we pass room 8? St. Peter replies, well, the Presbyterians are in room 8, and they think they're the only ones here. You may have heard a joke like this before. The setup is generally the same. These jokes are a product of our society's kind of accepted understanding of what heaven is, what heaven looks like, how it works. But where exactly does this understanding come from? Where do we read about this cloud city with pearly gates in Scripture? At the end of Jesus' conversation with his disciples, which takes up a big portion of the Gospel of John, he turns his attention to God in prayer. As part of this prayer, he mentions eternal life. Jesus says to God, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Driving home from visiting my family yesterday, Claire and I were listening to a radio program called This American Life. They were telling a story about a father and his nine-year-old daughter. While the father was at home trying to work, his daughter would continually ask him questions. She was at the particular stage in her growth development, which I'm sure some of you parents may be familiar with, where the questions are always why, or explain this, or why not. He got so tired of it that he told her to write down all of her questions and he would answer them. So he expected to get a page with a few questions on it and perhaps a picture of a bunny rabbit. When she handed him her questions, they took up three single-spaced pages. The very first questions that she asked were these. What is life? Why? And where do we go when we die? Heaven? Explain. Is heaven another planet? These are good questions, right? Like this nine-year-old, I have so many questions when I read this passage about this eternal life Jesus speaks of. In fact, I started with about 20 questions and realized that sermon would have been about three hours. So I narrowed it down to three because you know the Trinity. Three questions about eternal life. What is eternal life? Where does this eternal life happen? Who gets to have this eternal life? These are short questions, but they're incredibly important. They have to do with the toughest stuff of life, the toughest stuff of faith. We really want to know the answers to these questions. We live in a world torn apart by chaos and death, in which our loved ones die unexpectedly, in which a concert for young people is the target of a deadly terrorist attack, a world in which death seems to triumph. So these are not just hypothetical questions. They are questions that seem to beg a justification by God. These questions do have some easy answers, if we're willing to accept them. Answers provided by our cultural understanding, or answers provided by a narrow reading of Scripture. Answers that appear to be conclusive. What is eternal life? Eternal life is to have all the best stuff forever. 
It's being given a set of wings and a halo, singing church hymns and playing golf all the time, getting eternal rewards. Where does this eternal life happen? Well, it happens in heaven, of course, which is this beautiful golden city sitting up in the clouds. Somewhere between the stratosphere and the troposphere, the streets are paved with gold, and the rivers, of course, run with chocolate. Who gets this eternal life? Well, hopefully we do, if we're good enough, if we say and do the right things, if we have been good people on our best behavior, we're in. There are moments in scripture when these answers to our questions seem justified. What is eternal life? In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, after the two have died and Lazarus is rewarded, Abraham describes him as being in comfort. What is being in comfort if not sleeping on a bed of clouds and enjoying eternal indulgence? Where does it happen? Revelation gives us a vision of what heaven looks like, as John describes streets of gold and a river of life in the new Jerusalem. Who gets eternal life? Throughout the Psalms, it is made clear that the righteous are those who are favored by God. They are those who will receive God's blessings. Taken alone, in isolation, these understandings of heaven seem to stand. This narrow view can be confirmed, if, that is, we are willing to adopt such a narrow view. Yet, such a view of Scripture does not stand. We cannot say that these perspectives tell the whole story. Scripture prevents us so many more voices participating in the conversation. We ask, what is eternal life? Scripture speaks not just about getting something, but about being in relationship. In our reading today, Jesus says, this is eternal life, that we may know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ. Eternal life is to be in relationship with God, to truly know God, and to truly know Jesus Christ. And we try to imagine knowing Try to imagine knowing, understanding, being in true, real, present relationship with God. Not connected to any particular time or place outside of the bounds of human conception. We ask, where does this eternal life happen? Scripture does not describe a location, but gives us a metaphor, an image. Jesus says to the thief as they hang on the crosses, Today you will be with me in paradise. He used a word for paradise which, in Persian, meant a noble man's, a noble person's park or garden. Essentially, the most beautiful place anyone in that ancient world could possibly imagine. So we try to imagine utmost beauty in being with Christ. Not just how an ancient person would have understood it, but as we might imagine utmost beauty and peace. We ask, who gets this eternal life? We may search for a checklist of things to do to make us good people, but scripture tells us Jesus came for the sinners. In Matthew 21, Jesus tells the disciples and the tax collectors, sorry, tells the disciples that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. We are forced to recognize that heaven is for sinners, people who are unworthy and know it, aware of their utmost need for acceptance, their need for God's grace, for forgiveness and love from God. These answers, these alternative perspectives, remind us that Scripture does not allow us to take a narrow view, especially not on the most important things, not on salvation or resurrection, not on grace or forgiveness or mercy. No, on all of these things, Scripture forces us to think more broadly, 
to stretch our minds and our imaginations to strive for God's understanding, which is more vast and inclusive than ours could ever be. As I search for the broad, encompassing answers to these questions, I'm reminded of my own limitations. In confirmation this year, I've told you plenty about it, we discussed death and resurrection. And in planning for the session on death and remembering how many questions my youth always have, I realized that I needed to write a disclaimer to start that particular session. This is what I wrote. I can't answer all of your questions about death. I haven't died yet, so I don't know the answers. This, of course, didn't keep my group from asking those tough questions, but I felt like it was an important thing to say about death. The same disclaimer applies to heaven, because I can tell our youth what I believe about what I am convicted and for what I hope. But to describe something that I've never seen and that I cannot understand, that I don't have the language to describe, is impossible. Renowned modern theologian Shirley Guthrie expresses this so beautifully. One of his warnings that he provides is that we should not get caught up in the knowledge of the furniture of heaven or the temperature of hell because the biblical writers were not concerned with these things. They understood the future to be in God's hands. Guthrie says that sometimes our best response to these questions is, I don't know, and we don't need to know. He follows this up with his own sort of calling. Where scripture places its emphasis is where we ought to place ours too living in the presence in the light of our future hope, knowing that what is going to happen to us will be better than the very best we can imagine in our wildest dreams. As we sit with our questions, what is eternal life, where does it take place, and who gets to experience it? As we wrestle with the answers and struggle to understand, we take comfort in the knowledge that God is bigger, more powerful, more loving than any of the answers we could hope to provide. We can place our hope, we can place our trust in the knowledge that any version of eternal life, any version of heaven that our minds can conjure up, pales in comparison to the joy and peace of knowing God and being with God. And for that I say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen.